I'm speaking today on Parashat B'Shalach. You know, this was a, a particularly difficult week for me, not necessarily because of personal issues. I'm so grateful for God in my life. I am so blessed. There are so many things that I can just give God thanks every single day, but I'm watching what's going on in the world. And this week I was sent a uh, an, an article or a plea from Coalition Quebec that there was a woman right here in our province and she was going to be aborting a baby almost at term, 32 weeks. Uh, another woman came to her and begged her to please have the baby and she would adopt it, but she still refused. And then we wonder why the earth is going through such turmoil. We blame it on the environment, on fossil fuel, but we are the problem. And that's why this Torah is so important. I remember over 40 years ago, I went to see a movie platoon. I was fully involved in the new age then. I didn't, I knew very little about God. And, but the, for those who never heard of platoon, it's a graphic, graphic picture of the war, a movie of the war in Vietnam. And when I saw it, I was swept. It was the horror, the devastation in it. And I remember standing outside the theater and I thrust my arms into the air and I said, to anyone who can hear me, please use me. I wanted to help to heal this world. I've always been a fanatic. People know that. At that time, I was deeply involved still in the new age, as I said, but there would be other days in the future when I would raise my hands to the heavens, begging God to be heard. Sometimes I, I didn't know who if he was out there, but today I know that he heard me every step of the way. And when I cried out, use me, I know that I'm being used. I knew then and I know now. I believe every single human being has a calling. Some are seemingly insignificant and some are very great. We all have a role. Whether we respond to it or not is up to us. God gave us the gift of free will. Now, there's no better teacher than personal experience that life can bring. No one can deny that. We can only learn so much from our books. We need to go through some things ourselves. Even the story, stories in the Torah, we look back and we hear these stories, but until we can apply them and, and, and see them in our lives, that's when we can make these great changes. I remember a story our rabbi, a blessed memory, told us. Now, he was brilliant. He taught thermodynamics at the age of 22. He had two master's degrees in engineering. And when he graduated, he went to work at a beer factory. Now, the guys who worked on the floor brought the masters of engineering, a real engine to repair. They wanted to test him. He looked at it. He didn't even know where to begin. He says, it doesn't look anything like the pictures in the book. All the men burst into laughter, and then they finally helped him out. That was a lesson in humility. And I've gone through that many times in my life. Hands-on is the best way to learn. Nevertheless, we do need the manual. So is there a manual for us to live our lives? I've heard people say, I have children, but there's no manual. Well, I'm not so sure that's true. Because if there's a creator who, like any great architect, he would have prepared his design in writing. He would want us to, to want to show us how to continue hands-on to build upon his design. In this case, a good life for us right here. That's his gift to us. He called it the Torah. The three major religions. Rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all stem from it, not vice versa, though may, they may disagree. They all have their books filled with their doctrines, dogmas, opinions, interpretations. Others also drew their wisdom from it. I wouldn't be surprised if Confucius, who lived between 551 and 479 BCE, read the Bible. I've read truth and wisdom in his words. However, there is a fourth branch for us to consider, biblical Judaism. This does not teach us a religion. 
It teaches us a relationship with our creator. It understands that the words of the Torah are to be taken for what they say rather than what so-called experts tell us that it says. Most importantly, it says, do not add or take away anything from my word. As we read the five books written by Moses, even if in our native tongue, though it was so difficult for the rabbis to translate it, we soon begin to see an amazing mosaic being woven, a pattern that craftsmen would need to create their design. The words were read, the words of the Torah were read and told to us by kings, by kohanim, priests, prophets, army officers, and simple people. They were heard by millions of people at Mount Sinai, not just one, not one witness, millions at a time when the mountain burned and trembled because it was far in too insufficient to hold God's light, to hold his ruach, his spirit, his kefod, his glory. We heard his voice, but we didn't want to hear it. We didn't want to hear it then, and most still don't want to hear it now. But we need to hear it, and we need to hear it soon because it holds the secret the, the, to solve every problem that's going on in the world today. There have been many men, leaders, dictators in their day, who were warned to turn away from their gods and turn to the one creator. Men like Pharaoh, who didn't want to hear. Because of his stubborn pride, the initial ten plagues destroyed all of his Egypt, except for his army which was consequently completely destroyed at the parting of the Sea of Reeds. Now, you'd think that Pharaoh would get it when he saw the pillar of fire holding his army back as the Hebrews crossed between two walls of water. Now, this miracle of the walls of water cannot be explained as a simple act of nature, although God does use natural things to display his powerful works. This was a miracle of timing and his control of nature as a sign to all humanity. We all have those signs in our lives, but do we pay attention? We might also think that God's people, the Israelites, would be awestruck forever thinking about the awestruck forever thinking about the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that led them on their journey. It was, however, very short-lived. In Parashat B'Shalach, the people complained of thirst several times, and each time they received water. They complained about hunger and were provided with meat, and in Hebrew, man, which we know as manna. Each time the next trial arose, they forgot God's provision and doubted him again. Isn't that how we all are? We're awestruck in the moment when we see God working in our lives in such a visible way. And then in the next moment when we're faced with another problem, we complain, we doubt, we cry out, are you really there? For two weeks during this week, two nights during this week, I just couldn't get to sleep. I was overwhelmed with concern about some things that I needed to do, as I said before, about things that were going on in the world, even about writing this message. When that happens, I get up and I write. That helps me to clear my head and to reason with myself and God about what's going on. The following day, I received two phone calls from people who helped me directly with what I was struggling we may read about how God intervenes time and again for the Hebrews as they were running towards freedom, but it's harder to realize that he is still doing the same for us. Both these people humbled me and reminded me that God is right there with me. He's in control. And then I thought, do I really leave room for God in my life? Or do I think that there are things that I have to do alone? When we're immersed in the details of what we have to handle, we forget that we have a partner with a capital P. That's what this verse, this coming verse in Exodus 14.8 reminded me of. 
And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, for the children of Israel went out with a biyad rama, with a high hand. Yad rama is an idiomatic, idiomatic expression referring to acting as if we have the power to accomplish things by ourselves. The Torah sets down, Torah sets down principles for us. When we get too proud or even too afraid to ask for help, thinking that we can or have to do things by ourselves, we can be attacked by whatever form that enemy takes. It can be a physical enemy, like in this case for Israel, as we've often seen in our future, in our history, maybe in our future too. But it can also be emotions like doubt, fear, insecurity. When we get to the point we're ready to give up, that's when we're humbled and we cried out to him. There's so many battles that are raging in the world right now, in every area of our lives. And one of these has to do with our health. In Exodus 15, 25 and 26, the Torah addresses exactly that. There, it says, at Mara, where they complained and didn't trust God, he made a statute and an ordinance. And there he tested them. And he said, if you will diligently listen, which means obey, the voice of the Lord, your God, and will do what was right in his eyes and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This idea is repeated in Proverbs 3, 6. We sing the song to our children. Do not be wise. In your own eyes, fear God and turn from evil. This way will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. The entire Tanakh confirms what the Torah is teaching. Do we realize that doubting the least little thing about our God can lead us to doubt everything? That's what I felt this week. I was doubting that God was with me. And then suddenly I was doubting everything about my life. Our walk on earth here is like the walk of the Hebrews from the time they left Egypt through their 40 years in the desert. They were learning to turn emunah, faith, to bitachon, trust. Chapter 1431 says, And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did to the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and they had they, they was translated as believed. They believed in the Lord. But when I looked at the word, the root was emunah, faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What did our Ranabi tell us, as well as Rav Shaul? Faith is a gift from God so that we have nothing to boast about. In chapter 14, 15 to 16, after Moses reassures the people not to be afraid, we read, and the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Speak to the children of Israel. Go forward, lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go in the midst of the sea on dry ground. He was showing us that it is the action that we take in response to the challenge that we face when we need to draw from that gift of emunah, faith, to take the next step. That requires an act of the will. And it's not always easy. We have to take our pride and put it in our pocket and take that act of faith. When we see the results, in this case, the Sea of Reeds parting, our faith is then turned into bitachon, trust. Then we can step in and cross over on dry ground. And that's the same with us in every instance of our life where we're struggling. Walking with our creator is the greatest challenge anyone can have. We will be tested time and again. Religious leaders and politicians may promise us a hunky-dory life, as Rambi used to say, but that is not the truth. But the good news is that the Torah gives us 
many signs to show us that he is with us. God is with us, Emmanuel. Its heroes are simple human beings with frailties, failures. They're not today's superstars. We're number one. We're the best who people love to idolize. They are not righteous as our sages have led us to believe. They're like you and me. We struggle, we're afraid, we have insecurities, but we have the creator of the universe on our side. I know that a rabbi used to say that it seems that he was repeating this message over and over again, because although it's a simple message, it's just not easy to do. The Torah basically repeats God's principles over and over because like children, they need to be drummed into our heads. But as we surrender, little by little, our lives begin to change for the better. I remember learning that once we were saved, we are a new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away and we're now like new. It's not true. It's not a one-shot deal. The process from leaving Egypt to reaching the promised land took 40 years. And that was just the beginning. When I said we need to hear it and we need to hear it soon, what do we need to hear? Well, I recently heard an Israeli say that Israel does not have a constitution. That's the furthest thing also from the truth. Our constitution, written by the finger of God, was handed to Moses on Mount Sinai. His Ten Commandments. We build upon our faith, our amuna, when we apply these commandments like mathematical equations and then take the action needed to solve the problems in our lives. That's how we build trust in the one who helps us bear the heavy burdens that we think we have to carry alone. Let's memorize them. Let's learn to apply them. Let's teach them to our children. And let's read these wonderful stories in our Torah. There's a saying that it takes a community to raise a child. And it also takes a community for us to grow in. Shabbat Shalom.